Hi there, welcome to or welcome back to the Shift Control Podcast. My name is Paul McAnallen. Thanks for joining me um, on this podcast, which is an in conversation podcast with um, a gentleman called David Hoffeld, who is the CEO of the Hoffeld Group, um, an American based um, sales and business development organization, and also the author of a book called The Science of Selling. Um, which is probably one of the best books on the discipline of sales and persuasion that I've read in quite some time. Um, he uh, takes neuroscience, social uh, psychology, behavioral economics, some old school selling um, strategies and just puts together a really strong body of work that uh, looks at selling from a really different perspective and a lot of the time from the, from the, the eyes of the buyer um, talks about buying decisions, talks about um, the uh, just a whole lot of stuff that's really, really interesting. Um, the book is um, called The Science of Selling. Um, David's uh, website is the hoffeldgroup.com, H-O-F-F-E-L-D group.com. And I would suggest that you visit the website at some point, but definitely get the book um, because get your hands on the book because it really is a brilliant read. Um, a bit of disclosure on this particular um, podcast. It was recorded kind of late in the day for me and early um, in the day for David. So the energy levels are kind of a little bit out of balance, but I hope you really enjoy um, the content because um, getting him on the podcast, getting him on the show rather was a real coup. And I hope that is translated into the content. So um Without any further ado, I'd like to um, welcome um, David to the show, and I hope you enjoy the podcast. David, hi, welcome to to the show. Um, I'm in Belfast. Can you tell me where you are and give us a bit of background um, to yourself? Hey, Paul, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is David Huffeld. I am the CEO and Chief Sales Trainer here at Huffeld Group, and we're a research-based sales training, coaching, and consulting firm. And what we really specialize in is taking the findings of behavioral science, cognitive psychology, social neuroscience, behavioral economics, and translating them into actionable selling strategies. And I am in Minneapolis, Minnesota, here in the United States. So it's great to be with you today. Thank you very much. That's the home of Bob Dylan, is it? I that's a good question. Boy, you're starting off with the tough ones. <laughs> okay, I'm no, not no. sure. Well, no. I don't, I don't think it is, but you might be right. I'm not sure where Bob Dylan comes from. <laughs> okay, no, I, well, I'm going to probably edit that out and maybe just carry on here. <laughs> okay, I'll um, Google that afterwards. So, so, so we we I got um I I got your name um I got your book first of all I guess the science of selling um which um. There's a, a guy, John Demartini, who said, if you're ever going to read anything, review the author. First of all, read a paragraph or two about the book before you delve into that. And I did that. And I um, honestly, David, um, I haven't been let down. So c- can you just give us a, an overview of the science of selling? The science of selling is based on over 10 years of research of mine delving into the psychology behind selling. What's happening in our potential customers' brains for them to make a buying decision? How do they create preferences? How do they make choices? Why do they choose one product or service over another? And the great news is there is thousands and thousands of objective scientific studies that have revealed these answers. And so what we've done over the last 10 years is spent a ridiculous amount of time Uh, reading academic journals and then taking that science and dusting it off and testing it in the real world of selling. So it's practical, practical. And the science of selling basically catalogs that. How do we literally sell the way our customers' brains are wired to buy, to make buying decisions? And boy, what we've seen is when companies and individuals do that, they instantly become more successful. Okay, so... um I noticed in the back of the the book there are, I think, uh, 40 pages of academic references and educational resources that you tap into. What's been the striking recurring theme? Yes, so that's exactly right. So everything in the book is uh, very transparent where we get the ideas from, which is very unique. Many people have told me it's a different kind of sales book in that if you want to see, well, why do we tell you to ask questions a certain way, for example? We look at research that discloses how our brains reveal information, and then we created a questioning model based on that. And if you want to find out, well, I want to see that research for myself, actually read the studies 
If you want to, you can. You can just go to the back of the book and you can find the citations and you can do that. But really the common theme is that as human beings, we are predictable, meaning our brains are wired in a way that is very predictable, meaning when we're shown different options, there are certain ways we judge them. When we are given questions, there are certain ways we answer them. When we create a buying decision, our brain does it in the same way almost every time. And so that's how our brains are wired. And this, the sad reality is many salespeople, in fact, most haven't known this because all this great information has been hidden away in academic journals. And so once we've taken this science out and shown it to salespeople, it allows them to be so much more effective. And even more importantly, it allows them to better serve their buyers. It allows them to literally align how they sell with how people make buying decisions. And this allows our customers to make confident buying decisions that they feel good about. So it is, we found, been a win for everyone. And that's one of the things that really struck me about this early on in my research and testing phases many years ago is I thought it was going to help salespeople sell more. But what I was really surprised by very pleasantly was that people liked buying this way, that we, all of us, we have a good experience with a salesperson. Why is that? It's because they helped us make a good buying decision. What did they do? Well, they were tapping into how our brains make preferences, how we make choices. Likewise, we have a bad experience with a salesperson. Why is that? Well, because they violated this science. They violated how our brains make buying decisions. They made it hard for us. We got frustrated. And so this is mission critical. And it's so exciting. I believe there's never been a more exciting time to be in sales because of this research emphasis that now – Really, for the first time, we can base how we sell on solid evidence. We don't have to guess our way to success anymore. Yeah, so um, just before we went on there, David, we were talking about um, certainly in, in my uh, background and learning to, to sell, it was all about the seven or eight stages depending on who you learn from. And in the middle of that, there is the closing stage. But within the book, you talk about um, the buying decision being influenced by the entire process and not just the closing stage. And you talk about your six whys. That's exactly right. That was one of the really breakthroughs of uh, behavioral science. And this is based on decades now of research. And what they found is how do people create a buying decision or make a big decision like buying a product or service? And what the research conclusively shows, this is hundreds of studies, has shown that small commitments are the building blocks of the sale. In other words, the best way to get someone to make a large commitment, like buying your product or service, is to first guide them in making a series of small commitments that are consistent with the larger one. And it's absolutely fascinating when you see the research. And so what we did was about six and a half years of testing and to say in the sales context, what are these commitments? Because there's Many, many studies that have proven that small commitments are the building blocks of the sale, but what are they? What we found was that there are six specific commitments that if your buyers don't commit to, the buying decision will never occur. In fact, the buying decision breaks down and it results in an objection. However, if they commit to all six of these commitments, they're literally how their brain formulates a buying decision. So we often think that in sales, I know I was taught as well, Paul, that you know the commitment you want to focus on is at the close. That's where you go in and get this big commitment for people to say yes or no to your product or service. And though we do want to ask people to buy, that final commitment in the sale, the research conclusively shows, is intertwined and even dependent on this series of essential commitments that have already occurred. So we can set ourselves up for success at the end of the sale by focusing on getting commitments throughout the sale. In fact, the way I look at the sale is simply this. It's a series of incremental commitments that guide our potential customers on a progression of consent and naturally advance the sale. And this, I believe, is the biggest breakthrough the book reveals is that commitments matter, which we've always known in sales, commitments matter, but we now know what those commitments are. We don't have to guess. 
And if you can focus your sales process on obtaining these six commitments, you'll instantly be more effective. Why? Because these commitments represent the mental steps our brains go through when making a buying decision. In other words, as you guide your potential customers in making these commitments to what we call the six Y, you are literally guiding them on their mental journey and into a confident buying decision. So what, what you say there is quite a, a recurring message is the repeatable and predictable mental steps. So this is a process So these Ys are applicable to all kinds of selling regardless of the industry, regardless of the size and scale of the project, within reason, obviously? Yes, and that was a surprise for me, I'll be very honest. I had thought early on that depending on the type of sale, the buying decision would be different. But where I was mistaken, the research showed, is that this is not based on the sales environment, it's based on the brain. Meaning, how does our brains construct the buying decisions? And our brains are very predictable, and they follow a, um, a methodology when making it intuitively. It's just how we're wired. And so once we understood that, it gave us such insights. Now, applying this does shift depending on the sales cycle. Complex sales, it's going to take longer over many sales calls. But the brain's progression doesn't change because it's based on our brain. And so, yeah, it's very exciting because it's based on brain science. Now, applying that, that is where some of the art comes in. How do we do that effectively? We leverage science, actually, in doing that, too. But, yeah, the, the brain decision-making process, those mental steps, applies regardless of what you're selling. Why? Because it's not based on what you're selling. It's based on how the brain constructs a buying decision. And so I, I think... Boy, this is one of the biggest breakthroughs in sales in a long time because I have so many people. We work with many companies all around the world, but I have so many people who read the book. I just had one last week who said, I read the book on Sunday. I redid, tweaked my sales process, and on Monday I went out, and I was, he told me he sold a deal uh, that never they never close on one visit, and he was able to do it on one visit. Why? Why did we speed up sales cycles? Because we're helping people buy. Yeah. Uh, we're helping, we're selling, we're presenting information, we're guiding them through those mental steps they need to make anyway. And so rather than hoping they make them on their own, you intentionally take control and guide them through your sales process, and it really helps buyers buy. And, and I think one of, one of the things that I, I got out of it was the whole focus on becoming a problem solver. Um, but you need to find the problem, first of all, and, and it's about challenging the status quo, what you call the status quo bias, people's reticence to change. And then when you start getting into that emotional, intelligent mindset, then really it's not about just a list of features and benefits. In fact, it never has been a list of features and benefits. Yes, and that's one of the things that really frustrates buyers, uh, our research showed is when salespeople just blindly list features and benefits or they sell in ways that they would want to be sold to. And so what, what a science-backed way of selling does, it's very practical. And what it focuses us on is the people that matter, the buyers. It says what's going on inside their mind. And I'm focusing so much on them and presenting. So instead of presenting features and benefits, uh, I want to always – connect the dots between my feature or its perceived benefit and what matters to my buyer. So the focus must always be on the buyer because all of us as consumers have been frustrated with salespeople when they talk about things we don't care about. And this is one of the biggest complaints uh, about salespeople. And in fact, the research shows the majority, over 75% of sales calls, first sales calls, fail to generate a second sales call. Why? People don't see value. Most voicemails, emails don't get returned. Uh, people just don't see value in talking to salespeople. And in the book, we talk about exactly why that is. And one of the ways we can generate high levels of value is by connecting the dots between what you offer and what your potential customers care about. Meaning, we need to be relentlessly focused on our customers. And too often in sales, we become seller focused, meaning it's we assume people are curious about our company. Let me tell you about my company. Let me tell you about our products. No one cares. The reality is no one cares about your company. No one cares about your products. What they care about 
is what matters to them, a problem that I want to solve. Now, if you can show them how your company, product, or service can help them in meaningful ways and solve a meaningful problem, now they're interested. But we have to connect the dots. We must get better at this. And in the book, we give many strategies to, to do this. But we must get better at connecting the dots and not just throwing out statements and helping, hoping that people – you know, see the value, we have to make it easy, very transparent, and connect the dots between what we're doing, what we're selling, and what they want, so that they can easily perceive value. And if we do that, engagement goes up, and so does their receptiveness. And, and the, the, the idea that there's a certain type of salesperson or I mean, you use we use the word salesperson, but it's ultimately about becoming a person of value, isn't it? It's about having something that's beyond the product. It's it's that understanding. It's that tangible and intangible value that everyone hopes to create. That's exactly right, and that's one of the biggest shifts too. We've also seen in the last even few years is that in the past, when I first got started in selling. People would wait for value, meaning they would put up with a product or service presentation. Hopefully, in the end, when they bought, they would get value. They were willing to wait, not anymore. Today, with the influx of information, they can find out about your company, product, or service online. They can talk to people. They can see reviews. So now what they want is value throughout every stage of the sale. Even in the early stages when we're asking questions, we have found that buyers um, – are unwilling to just sit there and answer a whole list of questions. They want value even in that. So they want insights, meaning if you want me to answer three questions, I, I want some insight. I want some value given, not just in the questions, but I want you to add something to the conversation. So now it's much more of a dialogue, and salespeople must become value creators. The era of the generalist, the sales generalist, is over. Now we must become experts in our industry, in our product, in our service, because if you don't, number one, you won't be able to generate enough value with buyers to really gain an audience with them or keep it, and second, you'll be replaced. Right now, there is a huge movement in selling with AI, artificial intelligence, and so lower – just general sales information um, is – there's a whole movement trying to replace salespeople, and I think they'll be somewhat successful in those who are generalists, those who don't have any specialized knowledge but just asking certain questions or going through basic sales functions. And so we need to elevate our game and say – we now have to become experts. We have to be able to give value throughout every stage of the sale. So this is mission critical, I think, and this is a big shift that's happened even in the last few years and I think will continue to occur, is that the age of the generalist is over. Now we need to be experts in what we sell. Yeah, I think that uh, one of the questions that I that I that I um, was going to ask based on what you said was the the kind of clash of cultures from a very data driven culture where it's all about analyzing trends and um, you know you the, the you can get whatever information you want from a, a cluster of figures and data to tell you that this is where you need to go and your customers will follow. But you know a lot of businesses still want to really. Uh, work person to person i mean that's the only way that ever going to work is person to person so it can only be if you're adding i always thought that the idea of a, a consultant is someone who knows at, at least at the very least more than the person they're selling to yes i uh, absolutely we have to we have to become experts in what we do we have to be able to give value because our buyers are demanding that now it's no longer an option it's no longer the best of the best that need to do this it's all of us because that's what buyers want they're looking to us not just to give them a generic pitch but they're looking to us for insights for advice on because they don't have they, they, you're exactly right. We want this interpersonal relationship. People still buy from people. And buyers, research shows, can get part of the way through the sales process without talking to a salesperson. They can glean basic information online and kind of narrow it down to a few companies and products. But then they, the decision process stops, and they want to talk to a person because they need that reassurance. They need those questions answered. They need insights because they're not sure which way is the best way to go. And so they need a salesperson to guide them the rest of the way. And so the way you sell, 
matters more than ever before because you and I are in a hyper-competitive marketplace. There are more competitors than ever before. Not only that, but when I first got started in selling, I could hide my competitors. No one knew about them. Now all you do is pull out a, a smartphone or your computer and do a quick search, and you can find all the major competitors in your area. And so we're in a hyper-competitive marketplace. So, And also there's a lot of product and service parity, meaning there's many competitors that most likely do something very similar to what you're doing. So how do you win? One of the ways we've seen is how you sell. How you sell matters today more than ever before because it can differentiate you. If you can guide people through their buying process and guide them into a confident buying decision, that gives you a significant competitive advantage regarding, uh, in comparison to most salespeople who are still selling like they did 20 years ago. And it just doesn't work anymore. So those who are elevating their game, who are applying this practical science into the real world, are getting an unfair advantage. And what we're seeing right now is they're dominating competitors. So if you want to stop competing and start dominating, this is exactly how you do it. The, uh, the six whys, is a, um, especially whenever you put it in the context of um, the small stages of you know, getting small commitments and continually securing commitments throughout the process. I love the way the six whys fits in. It's, it's very, very, um, it's a really logical strategy, David. And um, I can, I, you know, it's, um, it just makes a lot of sense. One of, one of the, the other things that you mentioned, um, you talk about um, positioning, you talk about very clear messaging. Um, and before we went on air, we talked about the relationship or the lack of relationship between sales and marketing a lot of the time. Um, in, in the book, you talk about a competitive advantage being in two areas. One is cost leadership, and the other one is different, being different, differentiating for the right reasons. Yes, and I think that's where, with so many competitors, we must focus on really how we're different. And how, one of the ways is, as I mentioned, how you sell is a key differentiator that many companies overlook. Uh, if we can leverage some of the science in our favor, it gives us a significant advantage over those who aren't, even if our products and services are almost identical. But there's more than that, as you well mentioned. The sales and marketing in the past, we talked about aligning sales and marketing. We've been talking about that for the last 30 years. And because of the overlap now with sales and marketing, meaning marketing is getting more into sales and sales is getting more into marketing, I think we're past alignment. I think now we're into collaboration. Yeah. We must have collaboration. And as I was mentioning to you before we went on air, one of the things that we've just started working with a few organizations on, we're in the very early stages of testing, but so far it looks extremely positive, is leveraging those six whys as a common language. Because it's amazing, when I go and speak at conferences all around the world, I have as many marketers in the room as it seems salespeople many times, and marketers come up and say, oh yeah, this is very applicable to what we're doing. And so it got me thinking, boy, how applicable could some of this be for marketing? And it's been fascinating to leverage the six whys as one instance, but many things in the book marketers have utilized. And uh, the six whys give a common language because most marketing, in fact, all marketing messages are focused on at least one of those six essential commitments as our sales. And so we need to foster that collaboration because marketing has such insights and so much information that sales can use to continually give value because that's what we want. Every time we follow up, every time we engage a customer uh, or an existing customer, we want to give something of value. So sales and marketing must be collaborating, and this can be a huge differentiation because I have found most companies have amazing insights, amazing uh, information that their customers would love to have access to, but they don't because sales isn't aware it even exists. Yeah. And so marketing has the information and sales doesn't know about it, or sometimes sales has information that marketing needs. And they don't tell marketing. And so we, we have to bridge this gap and we have to start collaborating. And I think this is a key differentiator as well. Organizations that have collaboration between sales and marketing are much more effective because marketing and sales, are there's so much overlap now. The wall must come down and this can be a huge differentiator for companies when they do so. So, so just on, on the six whys, is it, is it okay to just walk through the six whys and give us um, sort of step-by-step -step examples of, of how that works? 
Absolutely. I'll go through them real quickly here. Okay. The six why. So the first one is the fundamental why. Uh, it's the fundamental commitment we must get uh, to advance the sale, and that is why change. Why should your buyers change what they're currently doing? And this is our biggest competitor. In fact, you and I as sales professionals have lost more business to nothing than to someone, meaning most of the time when our customers don't buy from us, they don't buy. They just say, I'm going to wait. I mean, we'll do this next year. We're going to think about it. And so the first commitment we must get is why change? Uh, another one we need to focus on, and these commitments happen sometimes with overlap, and they happen at different times. So I'm going to give them in an order. The order can, uh, after that first one, can be jumbled up depending on the sales environment. Okay. The next one I'll share is why now? Why should So I need to make a change. Why do I need to do it now? Why can't I wait a few months, a few years? So given a compelling case for now and also not – the way we present this matters, too. We talk about it in the book how many salespeople will create feelings of high pressure, where people feel pressure to do something, and then what happens? They push back. They say, I don't like when I feel pressure. And so oftentimes when we speed up sales cycles, we create what behavioral scientists call reactants, which is those feelings of, of pressure. And when that happens, people instinctively push back. The great news is there are ways to reduce that, to create urgency without creating the feeling that you, as a salesperson, are pressuring the buyer to act while still creating urgency. So powerful stuff. Third why is why your industry solution. This one I call the silent sales assassin because many people never see it coming, unfortunately. And why your industry solution is can your potential customer subvert your entire industry and create a solution themselves? Oftentimes they can, and it might not be as good as your solution, but it's still in their eyes. It might be less expensive, and maybe it's not as good, but it'll work for now in their eyes. So how do we guide them in, in understanding that they need a provider like you to engage with? The fourth why is why you and your company. Why should someone choose to do business with you and your company? This is absolutely critical, especially in today's hyper-competitive marketplace. Fifth why, why your product or service. So I need to make a change. I need to do it now. I can't do it myself. I, I want to work with your, you and your company, but why should I engage in your product or service? There are so many other options I could choose. Why is this one the best solution for me? And so making a business case for that is imperative. And last but not least, why spend the money? This really is the prioritization of the purchase because most organizations, most individuals have a limited amount of funds. And if they buy something from you, that means they're not going to buy something else. So, for example, we had a client recently who was selling a CRM uh, package, and they have CRM software. And they were working with an organization, and the company came back to them and said, we're struggling. We, we want to move forward. Uh, we we want to move forward with you, and we want your CRM platform. However, we only have a limited amount of funds in the budget. And we also need some machinery for our factories. We only have enough money this year to buy either the machinery or your CRM platform. And we're not sure which one we need more. And so now this salesperson is going against kind of an odd competitor, uh, machinery, something they've never done before. But that gets to why spend the money. Why should they invest in your solution versus anything else? How do you make that case? And all these whys can be answered with some really powerful science that we apply to it. But that's the goal of every sales process, we say, is does your sales process guide buyers through making commitments to each of these whys? If it does, you will be effective. If it does not, that's a bottleneck that will cost you sales. So that's how you judge a sales process. One of the ways is, is it accomplishing each of these six whys? And if it is, you're in good shape. If it's not, it's something you need to address. And when organizations do this, boy, sometimes sales skyrockets. We have seen some really neat things happen. I mean, doubling sales. I mean, tripling sales. We had one company. Um, and even these are large companies uh, that are using the six whys, applying them to the process, and instantly they get more effective. Why? Because that's how they represent how people buy. And you're literally aligning how you sell with how the brain makes a buying decision. The, um, it's interesting, going back to one of the whys, why choose your company? And that goes back to the features and benefits dump that people are moving away from. But 
Um, in the book, you talk about sharing insights and showcasing expertise, which I think is um, it's really is critical. It goes beyond just you know the company features and benefits. It's it's becoming someone of value. Your insights are relevant. You've got strategic a uh, perspective. You've got research, um, and you've got a, you've got all of the things. But but everything uh, builds towards uh, trust. You know, you talk about expertise as a primary component of trust, and that's something that's incredibly important in relationship building or selling or buying anything. It, it's absolutely, absolutely right. In fact, one of the interesting things from our research on this why is how do you get people to commit to you and your company? And what we found is really interesting. Focus on yourself first. Focus on yourself first. So what that means essentially is we found that there's a direct correlation between the trust a buyer has in a salesperson and the trust they'll put in the company. In other words, if they don't trust the salesperson, they're rarely going to buy and trust the company. If they do trust the salesperson, they're far more likely to trust the, the company. Why is that? Because everything meaningful that they know uh, from interacting with the salesperson about a company or product or service comes from the salesperson. So if I don't trust the salesperson, I don't trust what he or she says either. I don't take it that seriously. I'm not willing to act on it. So as we generate trust with our buyers, as we position ourselves as an expert, as someone that gives relentless value, that trust spills over into the company. It naturally goes. And so the best way to get someone excited about your company, to trust your company, is to first focus on you. Are you generating the trust? Are you positioning yourself effectively so that your buyers are taking what you say seriously and being willing to act on it? And if you are, this commitment is relatively easy to get. If you're not, this is one you'll struggle with. So it, I, I'm, I'm conscious of our, our time, David. Um, I, I wanted There's a few things I wanted to, to, to um, sort of press you on. Um, mm -hmm. I, the book brings together some um, – my, my mention of the 40 pages of references is, is respectfully said because the work you've put in to bring it to this point is, is just remarkable and you're saving everybody else the hard work to do that. But you bring you, – you make so many dots joined together. You bring in emotional intelligence. There's a bit of um, – you talk about nonverbal communication and verbal communication, body language. You talk about tonality. You talk about um, a lot, lots of different things um one of the questions that i want to lead from that is um do you see a greater uh, um is training becoming more and more important in bigger businesses for those softer skills like emotional intelligence um or are a lot of the companies still focusing on the hard-edged feature and benefits where is where's the gap lie there that's a great question. Uh, yes, there still is, unfortunately, a gap with training. Uh, in a lot of companies today, sales training is poorly done, and oftentimes continual training focuses on product or service, uh, knowledge about a product or service, which isn't bad. It's just incomplete. Yeah. And so we really need to focus on really all aspects of selling, both the emotional intelligence piece, as you mentioned, as well as, you know, how do you present yourself? How do you present your product and service? How do you do these things? Because training matters so much because it really is what equips salespeople with the knowledge and skills to be successful, meaning why do salespeople use one behavior instead of another? Why do they sell one way instead of another? That default is they go to their training or lack thereof. Uh, and so training is the foundation. And so if your training is flawed, then your sales process and your sales execution will be flawed as well. And so this is mission critical for organizations. Organizations that don't invest in trail sales training, uh, good sales training, uh, science-based sales training, are at a significant disadvantage to those who do. In fact, we've seen that the companies that get a focus on really equipping their people are so much more effective. And oftentimes companies say, well, listen, the salespeople should take the initiative and they should just, you know, figure it out on their own, right? If they want to learn, they should read books. They should take courses. And some certainly do. Top performers do. But many don't. And so companies need to step up and say, you know, we need to equip our people. And this can make a huge difference on ROI. Uh, the return on investment on good training is astronomical. I mean, you can make some amazing increases in sales by equipping your people. And so I think this is somewhere that, that companies are still lacking 
Um, they're still trying to shortcut the process. And boy, when it's done well, it's amazing the results you can get. So I think sales training is mission critical, especially in today's selling environment, which is hyper competitive. In other words, if you're not moving forward today, you're falling behind. The marketplace is just too crowded and it's too competitive. So if you're not trying to push forward and improve your skills every day, you will fall behind because some people are. Trust me, there are people right now who are very hungry and they are trying, whatever you do, whatever your business is, there is someone right now strategizing how they can take your customers away. And that's the reality we're in. And so we need to respond to that and up our games. And so like at my firm, for example, we have, we have a relentless focus on what we call a growth mindset, which means we believe our abilities and skills are like a muscle that must be continually developed. And so if you're not moving forward, uh, that's a problem. Every day we have to get a little better than we were the day before. How do we provide more value? How do we become better at what we do? And that's the focus every organization needs to, to have is how do we improve ourselves? Because as we improve, our results will improve because our behaviors improve and we can really more meaningfully serve our customers. No, that, I would agree. Yeah, I've got um, work with some people um, who are both sides of the, the, the coin. One, one, uh, one type of organization would see training as an expense rather than an investment. And other organizations are going to the extent where they're providing mindfulness coaching and emotional intelligence training. And uh, as you say, it's just it's, it's it's whatever it takes for a competitive edge, you know, without sounding sort of too ruthless, but it is, it's a hyper competitive market and, and you've just got to be on your game, you know? So David, listen, thank, thank you very much for, for this is, this has been, a, um, uh, we've taken a little while to get to this point, but it's been really, really worth it. The, the science of selling proven strategies to make your pitch influence decisions and close the deal is easily one of the best books on a more scientific approach to selling than I've read. Genuinely, I think it's of real value to everyone. Um, for for those people that are listening, where can they reach you if they wanted to to connect with you or reach out to you personally? Yeah, go to our website, Huffeld, H-O-F-F-E-L-D, group.com, huffeldgroup.com. On there, there's all kind of information about the services we provide. We have some really innovative things we're doing with virtual learning as well. Really powerful stuff. Um, over a hundred different sales lessons, quizzing, sales simulations where you can try out what you're learning in a virtual environment. And then we have all kind of different free uh, and no cost information uh, on our website as well. White papers, articles, blogs. Uh, I have a podcast. Um, number of different resources there as well for you to learn more about science-based selling. So huffeldgroup.com would be the place to go. Brilliant, David. Th thank you very much. I'll reference all of that in the narrative for the podcast, but um, from Belfast um, to the States, thanks very much, and we'll chat again soon. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Paul. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed um, the conversation with David. Again, a little bit of further disclosure. I uh, am only really coming to terms with the um, interviewing people when you're not actually face to face which I find really difficult I had a lot of questions lined up for David and some of which I never got around to asking and probably some of which I repeated um, but honestly um, if you're into this space at all um, and if you really um, want to try and improve on how you develop your business and how you want to engage with your clients um, The Science of Selling is a must I swear to God it's just a brilliant book it's really really well written um, the perspective and the, the, that it throws, the challenges that it's going to pose to you when you're thinking, um, it's just really brilliant. So thanks for listening. Um, David is available um, at the hoffeldgroup.com. He's also um, on Twitter at um, David Hoffeld. Um, so that's H-O-F-F-E-L-D. Thanks for tuning in. Um, you can get me um, at shift control. 66 or at shift-control.co.uk so once again thanks for listening and um, i'll catch up again soon